Hello, this is Dr. Moyer, and we are going to be covering family systems theory, um, which was developed by Murray Bowen, who was born in 1913 and died in 1990. He was trained as a psychiatrist. He earned his degree from the University of Tennessee and later became employed by Georgetown University and developed the Georgetown Family Center where he was the director until his death. Um, he also maintained a private practice and his psychiatrist background clearly drives this theory because the theory's most applicable context is within therapy. Um, and so he looked at therapy in a very different way that included looking at the social context beyond just individual development. So an overview of systems theory, the basic concept is that the family is a natural living system. And then there are four concepts and assumptions that drive the theory, chronic anxiety, um, the source of one's anxiety is a reaction to a disturbance in the balance of a relationship system. And so the theory talks about acute anxiety, which is a response to a real threat and short in duration, and chronic anxiety, which is a response to an imaginary threat and a more enduring duration. And it's this chronic anxiety that helps determine when there is a dysfunction within the family system and where the dysfunction is lays or lies. The second concept and assumption concerns basic life forces. They are togetherness and individuality and they are two competing forces. Um, togetherness entails the pressure and desire to be like others to agree on beliefs, principles, values, and feelings. And togetherness assumes responsibility for the happiness, comfort, and well-being of other people in the system. The other force um, which works against togetherness is individuality. And this is the motivation to divine a separate self from others and assume responsibility for one's own happiness, comfort, and well-being. You can see how they're two competing for forces within a system. So being together with the family, but also developing one's own identity. The emotional process is defined as the instinctual drives, reproduction and responses controlled by the auto, auto, I'm sorry, <laughs> autonomic nervous system. And so Feelings, according to Dr. Bone, can be felt while emotions operate outside of awareness. So feelings like joy, despair, anger, guilt, he would say that there's surface awareness of emotions, and some of our thinking is influenced strongly by emotions and feelings, while other thinking is independent of them. Um, but the family system has an emotional process of their own, and finally, the family as an emotional unit, the deep multi-generational connection between family members that significantly influences the behaviors of its members outside of their conscious awareness. And pathology in an individual member of the family is actually viewed as an imbalance of the family emotional system or emotional unit. So how the family system works together and functions together is the primary drive in whether or not there is healthy functioning or dysfunctional functioning. There are eight interlocking concepts that are also a major part of this theory. Um, the different differentiation of self, how individuals are able to think and act for themselves. Um, how people cope with life dema life's demands and pursue their goals on a continuum from most adaptive to least adaptive. And a person with a solid, well thought out sense of self um, and principles is considered a solid self or has a solid self. 
A person with less solid self will feel pressure to think, feel, and act like other members of the system. Triangles refer to relationship formations. The triangular relationship dot, um, I am so sorry, system, meaning three-person system, is the most stable of the um, relationship makeups. So a two-person dyad can become unstable fairly easily unless a third person's pulled in to relieve some of the anxiety. So Dr. Rowan believed that the three-person system, anxiety has more places to go, and it's a much healthier type of relationship formation. And that all systems are made up of triangles that are interlocked with one another. The nuclear family emotional process refers to the conflict, emotional distance, over and under functioning reciprocity. And reciprocity occurs when one member of a two person dyad takes on the responsibilities for the relationship. The family projection process refers to the transmission of emotional problems from parent to child. When anxiety is focused on a child, the child develop problems, according to the theory. Parents then focus on fixing the child or asking an expert to help change the child. But Bowen would say that parents need to manage their own anxiety and relationship issues, and then the child will automatically improve. Emotional cutoff refers to distancing from other family members and this leads to chronic anxiety when this occurs. Multi, the multi-generational transmission process refers to the patterns of emotional processes through multiple generations. So how the patterns are transmitted from generation to generation. And Bowen says that they're transmitted through the patterning and the functioning of the triangles. Sibling position. Um, where a child is, or, or when a child is born, the timing, the relationship to the other siblings in that re, um, family system, as well as in the parents' family systems of origin, um, influence how the family roles play out for the siblings. Um, and different positions tend to move towards different functions. More on that in a little bit. Um, society, um, societal emotional process, tendency of people to be more anxious and unstable at certain times. So we're not, we're still affected by society. We don't operate in a bubble. Um, there can be times like during overpopulation, during war, epidemic, um, recession or depression, Anything that's going on in greater society is also going to affect the emotional process of the family system. Um, and that really, if you were to Google systems theory, you would see that um, the theory talks about circles. And at the middle, um, the microsystem is the family. And then around the outside of that, you have the relationship between the family and the um, mesosystem. Hold on, I may have that wrong. <laughs> Hold on one second. Microsystem. Exosystem, macrosystem. I'm so sorry. Okay, so the mesosystem refers to the relationship between the microsystem and the um, exosystem. And then the exosystem refers to social contexts outside of the family that are still close to and affect the family, like school, work, church, um, things out, you know, the neighborhood, things outside the family that are still close. And then you have the macro system, which encompasses things like culture and um, other forces within society. 
And so Bowen believed, I didn't go into the circles too much because, I mean, that is the most basic visual that is used with the theory. And it's important to understand those circles and understand the relationship. But I want everyone to get that at its most basic level, what Bowen was saying was that the family does not operate outside of social influences and that family affects environment and environment affects family. And so I wanted to talk about the concepts separate from the drawing of the circles. Okay, some focus and scope assumptions. Um, hopefully this will help you understand the theory a little better. All parts of the system are interconnected. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. A family is much more than just a collection of people that live together and are related to one another. It's a social system with its own rules, its own roles, communication patterns, and power structure. Um, the next assumption, understanding is possible only by viewing the whole family. So you have to view the entire system in order to understand part of it. Because what happens in one part of the system affects the other parts. And that's at the core of this theory. Um, behavior affects environment and environment affects behavior. Um, in studying families, we are usually concerned with the feedback, whereby some of the output of a system becomes input. Um, and so how somebody responds to something external also affects um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of an example. So, behavior affects environment, environment affects behavior. When you're in a restaurant eating, um, and we've all had this the experience, or even being on a plane with the baby crying, so the baby's behavior affects the environment, right, of the restaurant or the plane, and the environment affects behavior because not only um, can the baby be influenced by how others in the plane or the restaurant are reacting to the crying, um, but people are as well. And so Bowen would say, you know, it's the child crying on an airplane is going to have an effect on everyone around him. Um, we might become irritable and respond with irritability or other types of negative behavior that could continue to arouse the child in a negative way. It can continue the screaming and the crying. Um, and so I hope you see how this is reciprocal, the relationship. We, the baby isn't just alone, and how we act affects that baby's environment. Um, rules are discovered in retrospect and are subject to the redundancy principle that is referring to the repetitive patterns of interaction that families typically live by. Um, some rules are very clear and overt and others are unstated and covert. Usually the most powerful rules are those that are unstated and covert. Um, an example could be like who gets to control the remote control. Um, or maybe one daughter is kind of allowed to be mouthy with the parents but the son is not. Um, or maybe the dad or father figure can go out with friends on the weekend, but the mother cannot. Couples create rules of the relationship when they meet, whether they're aware of it or not. And since there isn't an endless supply of behavioral responses for every situation, some rules are selected and used over and over, which is referred to as the redundancy principle. The next assumption is that feedback loops guide behavior. When family members move outside of the accepted limits of family behavior, the other members of the family will engage in what's called a feedback loop to get the, a family member back in line. And so negative feedback occurs when the family punishes someone for breaking the rules, um, trying to correct the behavior and get the member back in line and how they normally act. Positive feedback is a rewarding response for the deviation. Um, and so 
you reward, like a therapist might reward a family member that's trying to change a destructive pattern. So there can be negative and there can be positive. Families are often unaware, um, may not even realize a feedback loop is occurring. A good example could be there maybe is a child in the family that is overweight throughout childhood into adulthood and plays this um, funny fat child role, um, for lack of a better term, where they're just silly and this is how they compensate with maybe the negative self-image and the family accepts the situation as it is and, and it operates in a certain way. If that member decides to lose weight or is able to lose weight, it can change their identity and how they interact with the family members. And that could be upsetting to the family system. They may be like, wait, whoa, we've lost our family clown. We need this person back. And they may be cold and indifferent or um, it could result in conflict or lack of communication. But they're trying to get the family member to behave the way they always have. Uh, pathological communication causes relationship problems. This is the basic tenant, again, of, of systems theory. Um, there can be contradictory communication, what is sometimes referred to as double blinds. An example could be the schizophrenic son hugs his mother when she visits him in treatment. She stiffens in response. He withdraws a result, and she gets angry and accuses him of being cold and not loving her. Um, so that's, you know, there's, <laughs> the messages are not very clear there. But when's, what ends up happening is the son is blamed for not being affectionate. Um, it is the communication that therapists will work on and try to fix um, and, and try to eliminate those double blinds and try to encourage effective communication among the family system. Um, finally, all members have specific roles, usually more than one. And refusing to play one's role can upset the whole equilibrium and result in negative feedback, a feedback loop. Um, the classic example used has always been the alcoholic family. So there's a husband with a substance abuse problem. He's an alcoholic. Um, the wife is the enabler and allows him to be this alcoholic. Um, the firstborn child is the hero and is always fixing things, saving the day. The middle child is delinquent, acts out. The lastborn child is the clown that makes everybody laugh and be silly. And this is how the system operates. And if anybody, if one person changes, the entire system has to change. And that's why the system will fight to maintain equilibrium and get back to the way it's always been. Hence why families have a difficult time changing when they're fighting against this system and a system that wants to maintain sameness. Um, some criticisms of the theory. I've mentioned before that the theory has its greatest utility in therapy. That's where it was developed, um, and that's where it's used the most. You will probably never find a family therapist program or training that doesn't include systems theory. Um, another criticism is that the theory was developed on the nuclear family and doesn't include different family types. Um, that has changed through the years. Different theorists have added to the theory and extended it to include other family types, but the criticism is that it was created or developed based on the nuclear family and that it was based upon a patriarchal hierarchy within the family where the father has the most power and control. And, and that is yet another criticism of the theory. As far as a developmental perspective, I know with the other theories we have talked a great deal about how children develop um, and what the beliefs are about that. Ultimately, it's believed that the child develops within the context of the family and the other systems like school, religion, work, etc. that they encounter. 
biology is the prime force on child development according to this perspective, but it's always going to be affected by environment or context. And anyone working with children is encouraged, or are, anyone are encouraged, to think about these four um, important parts of the theory, which can affect how the child behaves when they're in school or away from the family. So all families have boundaries, um, relates to limits, togetherness, and separateness or even who's in or out of the family. Um, some families have very open boundaries and they're open to new information and ideas and people. Um, others have more closed boundaries, but that affects certainly whether or not the child is going to be open to other new ideas or is going to be more rigid and closed. The role that the child has at in home um, and in the family setting, they could play the same role in school or they may not. Um, and whatever role they take on determines what kind of characteristics they have developed or skills they have developed. So if the child is not the rescuer or the problem solver in the family, they may not have fully developed their problem solving skills It may need assistance with that. Um, that's just an example every role is going to have its pros and cons and individuals that work with children need to be able to identify you know where the deficits are rules um, standards laws traditions within the family they certainly affect how children operate in the world um, some families for example believe in predictability so they're better at planning ahead while others may believe that things are out of their control and it's up to fate. And so they deal with circumstances as they arise. And that may be the case in how a child operates in the school system as well. Um, rules are embedded in a cultural context. So they're affected by the child's culture. And as I mentioned before, they can be spoken or unspoken. But children are usually pretty adept at <laughs> figuring out what the rules are and can tell you if you ask them directly um, what the rules are in their family, even the unspoken ones. The climate, of course, refers to the emotional and the physical environment. This is affected by culture, economic status, educational level. Um, and it's not that these things cause the emotional climate to be positive or negative, but how they affect the beliefs about family and children and parents and the roles and the rules that go along with that. So again, biology is a prime force though. So there still is a belief that biology determines child development, but that it is strongly affected by the social environment or the context. So that concludes the PowerPoint on systems theory. I have given or provided a link to the Bowen Center, which has a lot more detail about the theory. Um, there is a lot written on systems theory, and I encourage students to look up the circle model, the circular model, and try to just identify and see, you know, what that visual is about, but not to get too caught up in it. Um, the basic idea is important with the visual, but it's also important to know what the focus and scope assumptions are um, and what the propositions and, and tenets of the theory are. Okay, that is all.